Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this training. Thank you for being here this morning. My name is Jenny Appleby, and I am with Covering Wisconsin and the Milwaukee Enrollment Network. So as you can see on your screen, this is the training, the public charge texting tool training. A couple of logistics today. So really, my purpose here is just to host and kind of be the facilitator of this event. Um, as you'll see, a couple of things we wanted to address early on is that right now the attendees are muted. So if you could please, if you have a question, please enter that into the chat box. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. We do have a relatively high number joining us today, though, so we might not be able to get to everything, but we'll do our best within the next hour to address any questions you may have. A couple of other things too, we might not be able to get into specific case questions. So if you have a real detailed case, we might not be able to dive into that, but we'll do our best to answer more of those general questions. And we'll absolutely make sure that we get you the resources that you need so that if you have that detailed case, you'll know where to go to, to help you find some answers. Um, a couple of other things near the end of this training, I am gonna be using the chat box quite a bit We'll be entering um, an eval link in the chat box. So please, we always appreciate your feedback before you log off if you're able to do that eval. And then as far as um, any other housekeeping things, um, we'll make sure that you get contact information. So along the way, there'll be some things entered into the chat box in case you have follow up questions. We are recording this. This goes on to Covering Wisconsin's YouTube page. So I'll make sure that everybody who's attended today and who's registered online, I'll send out a link afterward with a recording of this presentation in case you need to get, go back to that to refer to some components of it. Okay, so real quick introductions um, of our presenters today. So our first presenter is Janice Beers and she's with the Catholic Multicultural Center, the Immigration Service Coordinator. So she is what we would call a DOJ or Department of Justice accredited representative. Um, Janice, I, if I can put you on the spot, do you mind just unmuting really quick? Cause I know people probably have questions about what that is. Absolutely. Um... Thank you, Jenny. So a DO, as a DOJ accredited representative, I'm authorized to provide immigration legal representation through a DOJ recognized nonprofit agency. So in my case, through the Catholic Multicultural Center. The focus of the nationwide recognition and accreditation program is to increase capacity of legal representation across the country to low or no income immigrants. So of course the chances of a positive outcome in an immigration legal case is significantly higher with legal representation. At CMC, we charge just nominal fees for, for services and we never turn down fees, uh, down services to anybody due to inability to pay. Thank you very much. And then our second presenter is Shannon Drake Burr. So if you've attended trainings in the past, you may have seen um, her name and her face before. She is with the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association. She is the Patient Engagement Coordinator. And Shannon, is there anything else you'd like to add about your role or your role within the Wisconsin Collaborative here? Uh, I'll just give a shout out. I see a lot of the community health centers, staff in the community health centers that we um, represent as an association on the call today. So a special hello to you all. And um, my main function has uh, just been to sort of organize and facilitate collaboration. Um, and I, and while Janice and I are presenting today, I just wanna acknowledge um, a lot of the work that Jenny, you've done to make today possible. And also um, Stephanie Sievers at Covering Wisconsin um, did a ton of work um, to get today's, to, to get to where we are today. So thanks. Thanks. And then the last one isn't up on the slide, but just recently as we were talking to Michelle Centeno, um, she is with Community Connect Labs and she's the implementation manager. So Michelle, can you kind of explain how you do a lot of that technology work behind the scenes for this project? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, Jenny, and thanks so much to everyone for being here today and for allowing us uh, the time to answer some of your questions. Um, so I work uh, for Community Connect Labs. We are a nonprofit that works with other nonprofits and government um, to make sure that we're getting um, really the tools and the services that governments and nonprofits already do uh, into the hands of people that need it the most. So really excited to be here today to answer your questions about how the texting tool works and how, how we can really improve this experience for all of your community. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. So as you'll see, once we actually dive into the tool, although it's hosted on a local Wisconsin web page platform, this is a tool that is not something that um, we locally designed, that it was through Community Connect Labs that we've um, purchased this tool. So really quickly, um, just kind of some of those guiding principles that kind of frames this whole training today. I won't read them word by word, but really just the emphasis on the fact that a lot of us are working with um, people from an immigrant community and just knowing that there is a lot of stress and challenges that come with that. Um, people have very legitimate concerns about how certain things are gonna impact their immigration status. And so by no means are you gonna to leave today feeling like a complete expert, but at least you have a little more tools so that you feel more comfortable working with um, populations that may have some of these questions that come up. Also, um, point number two, we just want to acknowledge that things do change often. So we are recording this today, February 1st, 2021. This is relevant as of today. We do our best to just keep open um, communication, listserv emails, things like that, just because we know that these kinds of um, this environment can change at any time. But as of now, everything today is um, current. And then really just we want to make sure that we are providing individuals with the tools and the resources so that they can make the best informed decisions from themselves. We generally are not in a position where we're telling somebody what to do, but we can help educate them so that they feel more confident in their decision making. And then lastly, if you um, registered for today, you probably saw um, a glimpse of this, but really we're going to start by just reviewing what public charge is, because some of you, this might be new to you, others it might feel a little bit like review, but just what is public charge, that concept, going through the tool, learning about resources, once you see the tool, if it's something you want to make sure that you can use at your organization, um, also getting to the point of if you want to actually see how you could integrate that tool into your organization's website, and then we'll definitely have some time for those questions and answers. All right, thank you. So we're going to begin, as Jenny mentioned, with a quick uh, review of public charge. And we're going to start with the five key messages. The first one being that most immigrants and mixed status families can actually safely use public benefits. Public benefits that are used by family members do not count against the person who uh, is applying for an immigration benefit and is subject to the public charge. And only use of specific public benefits can have a negative impact on a person's status. So there are many benefits which are not considered in the public charge assessment. Use of public benefits doesn't automatically make a person a public charge. The immigration officials look at many different factors when they're evaluating to see if, if um, someone is considered a public charge. And finally, the testing, treatment, vaccines for COVID-19 are not counted um, against the person in the public charge rule. So what is a public charge? A public charge is someone who the government believes is likely to receive benefits from the government. The government applies a public charge test to certain classes of immigrants who are changing or applying for a new immigration benefit. For example, um, the public charge is applied to an immigrant applying for a green card on the basis of a family relationship, like the spouse or a child of a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident or green card holder. In fact, family-based petitions account actually for approximately two thirds of the 1 million non-citizens who obtain green cards or lawful permanent resident status each year.
if a person's determined to public charge, this can affect their future ability to get um, a green card, get a visa to enter the United States, um, become a permanent resident, which is another, which is our legal term for saying get a green card or to change or renew um, their status. Um, in regard to changing or renewing status, uh, the public charge rule does not apply to green card holders who are renewing their green cards. So green cards are valid for 10 years. And um, when an immigrant, um, a lawful permanent resident applies to renew uh, their, um, their green card, they're not subject to the public charge rule. Um, also green card holders who are applying for US citizenship are not subject to, uh, to the public charge rule. The changes which we're talking about right now and reviewing went into effect on February 24th, 2020. And our focus is on the cases that are processed within the United States, not for the immigrants who are living abroad and, and processing, um, going through the consular processing process. So the good news is that most immigrants, in fact, can safely use public benefits. So here we have a list of um, different types of statuses that um, folks have that can actually safely use uh, any public benefits um, that they're eligible for. So US citizens are people who are applying to become US citizens, lawful permanent residents, uh, those who have green card holders. Of course, um, there's it's immigration law, the law is complex. There's always exceptions to every rule. So green card holders who are traveling outside of the United, United States for um, more 180 days or more would be subject to to the um, to the uh, going through the process of um, showing that they're um, not a public charge. Refugees or asylees not subject to public charge rule. Special immigrant juveniles. These are undocumented immigrants under the age of 21 who have been abused, neglected, or abandoned by one or both of their parents. Um, so all of these are really the theme of these um, types of these different um, immigration classes are their humanitarian visas. U visas are for victims of crimes and T visas are uh, victims of trafficking. Violence Against Women's Act approved self-petitioners. Immigrants with a status from the relief under the Cuban Adjust Adjustment Act, Nicaraguan and Central American Relief Act or Haitian Refugee Immigration Fairness Act. Afghan and Iraqi employees of the US Armed Forces, also known as SIVs, special immigrant visas. And then finally, members and families of the US Armed Forces, ready reserves or military serving uh, in active duty. So the immigration officers are only looking at the benefits that the indiv individual uses, not what their children or other family members use. For example, if a US citizen child receives food share benefits, this will not impact the child's parent, parent's ability to apply for a green card. Very important for us to, to keep in mind. There's a lot of misinformation um, on that topic. And then there are only certain benefits that are considered under the public charge rules. So here we have a list of those benefits and a few exceptions. So um, federal Medicaid in Wisconsin, Badger Care Plus, and it's for adults over the age of 21 that's considered under the public charge rule. There are, again, exceptions to this. So emergency Medicaid for both adults and, and kids are not subject to the public charge. And also Badger Care prenatal uh, services are not subject to the public charge. Housing assistance from public housing or Section 8, and then food share or the food assistance from food share, the Quest card or EBT. W-2 program in Wisconsin, cash benefits or uh, federal supplemental security income SSI program. 
and then finally assisted living nursing home or home care paid by Medicaid long-term care program. I, I just wanna take a moment to point out that most immigrants who are subject to the public charge are not actually eligible for most of these uh, federal, public charge, federal public benefits that count under the rule. And finally, um, any of the benefits that um, weren't listed on the slide that, um, that I just reviewed are not considered under the public charge and we'll go through those in a few minutes. Um, sure, let's go through them now. Okay, <laughs> so here's a list of, of um, the public benefit programs that are safe, many of them. Um, emergency services and Badger Care Prenatal, as I just mentioned, Marketplace Financial Help, Ryan White HIV Assistance, the School-Based Nutrition Services, WIC, uh, the Woman and Infant Children, Woman, Infant and Children Program, Child Care Assistance, Head Start, Financial Assistance for Education, and then COVID testing, treatment, and vaccination. Um, Jenny, why don't we go back to the other slide and then we'll um, talk a little bit more about the COVID. So um, this slide talks about the fact that when, in, when an immigration official is determining if an applicant is, is a public charge, they don't look only at their use of public benefits, but there's a number of factors that they take into account. Uh, in fact, when folks who are applying for a green card and they are subject to the public charge, they need to complete a, an 18 page application and document all of these different factors. So their uh, work experience, their skills, education, income assets, resources available to them, their age, their health, their family size, and there's also an affidavit of support, which all, uh, all, everybody um, who's subject to the public charge needs to submit with their green card application. An affidavit of support is a contract signed by the petitioner detailing that the applicant has adequate means of financial support and is not likely to rely on the US government for financial support. So if you, uh, look at this, this pie here that we have, the public benefit uses is, is one piece of it. So just to keep in mind the takeaway from this slide that just because an immigrant receives a public benefit, it doesn't automatically make that person a public charge. And now we're going to um, talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and the, um, the programs that are safe uh, from public charge. If we wanna move forward, I think one, yeah, there we go. So um, these, COVID, the, these, related, these programs related to COVID-19 are, are safe for our immigrant community to use. So any unemployment benefits, testing treatment vaccines for COVID-19, even, when it's paid for by, by Medicaid, coronavirus stimulus checks. I've had a lot of my clients ask me about this. It is safe. Take and go school meals, free internet for kids, mortgage and rent relief programs, student loan relief programs, and pandemic EBT benefits, which is different, right, from, um, from, the, from future benefits. And this comes on a white debit card. So we just wanted to address the impact of the new administration on public charge. Um, so we know that President Biden is expected to announce several immigration related executive orders. Um, it was to be last week and then it got pushed to this week. Um, so we know that's coming up. Um, we know likely in those executive orders, there will be something related to public charge. If you've been following this issue, the reason we're all here now, the reason the collaborative came together was because of changes that occurred during the Trump administration um, to public charge. And so those changes took place through a federal rulemaking process. Um, and 
when if the new administration makes changes to public charge again they will likely come through that federal rulemaking process and that typically takes several months so you'll probably continue to hear about this and just know that more changes are likely coming um i think yep we expect um because of the continued changes that confusion um will we'll still have a lot of confusion um and that even though the changes will be positive in that they will make public charge um they'll likely remove some of the programs that are under the consideration of public charge like concern and fear is going to remain um that's not just going to go away um even though things you know on paper might be getting better if you will um and just so you all know we will work to update the tool and written materials as quickly as possible um you know, you might see a little downtime if we need to update the tool once uh, rules change, um, but just come back to it uh, and we'll stay in communication and touch about the changes we're making. I think there's, uh, yeah, so specific to public charge, what would change? Um, only the benefits considered under, under public charge would, would change. So the ones that are in red are the ones that changed under the Trump administration. Um, just to give you an idea, if you haven't been following this over the past couple of years. And so that is what we would expect to be removed from the public charge rule. But again, it will likely take uh, several months to work through that process. So we were just going to pause here. Um, we're at 1024, and so we can take a few minutes to uh, discuss any questions that people have specific to um, just the concept of public charge or anything that we've uh, touched on, that Jan has touched on up until this point. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. The next section that we will be moving to is how to use the texting tool but we'll give everyone a beat to type in any questions they might have. While we're waiting for folks to type in questions, I just want to, it's um, just fantastic to see so many participants here and to help get this um, very important and critical information out to our immigrant community. Um, in my job every day, um, I, there are folks um, that I'm working with who are eligible for public benefits and are so afraid to um, apply and get the, the benefits that they're entitled to that really um, is critical for, for their health um, and well being. So um, thank you, everybody, for your participation. It's fantastic. So, Janice, I see we have a question. How does public charge status affect uh, their ability to apply for immigration? Yeah, that's um, kind of, um, there's so many different immigration benefits. And so um, if, if there's, um, let's just look at a specific example. If there's somebody who, um, um, mo most often what we see um, at CMC would be, um, very often we'll see a spouse of uh, a United States citizen who's applying for a green card here in the United States. And so they will we'll need to go through and fill out this 18 page application asking, detailing um, all, all of the factors. Um, and so, you know, how does it affect their ability to apply? I mean, one thing I want to say up front is there's a fear factor that there are people who don't apply because they're afraid of it. Uh, second is that it definitely takes longer to get the application ready. Um, I think it's an average of four to um, 10, depending on the situation, additional hours in preparing that green card application. And of course, when they go for their immigration interview, um, there are the interviews are longer and um, they're questioned on these, um, interviewed on these public charge issues. So it's basically more, more hurdles 
um, that they need to overcome. Green card holder. I'm sorry, here's a question. Can you expand on the part that says a green card holder could use public benefits unless traveling? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's um, that's a great question and I'm glad that you asked it. So the question is, if I can discuss uh, what it means when somebody, they have their green card, but they travel outside of the United States for 180 days or more. Uh, the What happens is when, uh, somebody who has a green card holder, they're lawful permanent residents of the United States. And so a green card holder is expected to permanently reside in the United States. If they leave the United States for more than 180 days, then it becomes a question, did they abandon their permanent residency or not? So when they're re-entering the United States, they need to go through that process of showing that they're admissible. So um, at that point, um, they are subject to the public charge rule. So at CMC, when we um, help folks get their green cards, become lawful permanent residents, we um, talk to them about their travel. We recommend um, that they don't leave for more than 180 days. And if they are going to, that they go through um, a process of applying for that permission in advance of their travel. You are most welcome. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to go ahead and talk about and talk about the texting tool. We will hopefully have time for additional questions at the end. So if you have a question, um, feel free to just uh, hang on to it, and we will get back to it. But first, we just wanted to give a very brief overview of the tool development. So this um, texting tool came out of um, California initially, um, and the first version of it was, um, was put into place by the Legal Aid Society of San Mateo County um, <clears throat> in a partnership, excuse me. And so we looked at that and we thought, huh, that's, that's really useful in terms of people being able to put in um, a specific immigration status and get some information back. And so we, um, in collaboration um, with uh, Community Connect Labs and Michelle, who's, who has graciously joined us this morning, uh, modified that tool for readability and Wisconsin specific public benefit program terminology. And so our legal expertise for um, adapting the tool came out of um, an attorney who's now with the Legal Action of Wisconsin and then also um, Janice at the Catholic Multicultural Center, and we're so grateful for the expertise and time that they've given the collaborative. Okay. Um, why a texting tool? Uh, we know a lot of people use their mobile devices to seek and obtain information, and this seems like a great way to reach people with information. Um, we also know that rules about public benefit programs and immigrants are confusing, and we wanted to reach people with straightforward information specific to their immigration status or the immigration status of the person that they are assisting. Um, and then we also wanted to connect people in need of legal advice uh, with low cost and free legal service providers who understand low, low income immigration law issues. So we know there are a lot of questions and even when people maybe get legal advice from, from an attorney, um, and Janice can talk about this a little bit if she wants, or, or they're getting legal advice from maybe some not so reliable sources, they might be hearing a lot of different things. And so we wanted to provide a connection to some reliable legal service providers um, who provide those services at a low cost or for free, depending on you know, your, the sort of qualifications of their various programs and who understand low income immigration laws um, and issues because, or not low income immigration laws, but the issues that surround uh, that population of people because advice you might get from a immigration attorney who works a lot on, who's focused on, 
not low income issues is might be very different from what you get from somebody who is really focused on this specific population and understands public benefit programs and understands the issues surrounding this. Janice, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, an example of that um, is that statistic that I gave earlier, how two thirds of the 1 million folks who are getting um, approved for a green card every year are actually family-based applications. So an attorney, the immigrants who are applying for green cards through a work, um, through employer-based applications, attorneys who focus on that type, uh, they're, they're also subject to the public charge, but their incomes are higher. And so generally this is not a barrier um, for that population. And so an immigration attorney who's focused more on, um, on employer-based um, applications might not work with the public charge or um, understand the issues that um, we see with our uh, low income or no income um, vulnerable population that, that we're working with. And also, I just wanna reiterate the importance of working with an immigration attorney with the DOJ accredited representative. So sometimes you'll see folks who are maybe working at tax preparation agencies or maybe volunteers in the agency um, across the community who are really trying to be helpful and have the best of intentions, but aren't accredited to do the work, aren't certified to do the work. So, um, but you'll be getting uh, here in the uh, later in the presentation uh, an outstanding list of, of resources that you can get help. Great, thanks so much, Janice. So next up, we're gonna look at the texting tool itself. So I would like everybody, I don't usually in a learning session recommend that people pick up their smartphones and start looking at them because I know that can be very distracting, but um, it would be great if everyone would uh, start a text message or if you use WhatsApp, um, use the number on your screen, or you can go to the website um, and use the web chat um, and get that opened up and kind of ready to use. Because part of what we're gonna do this morning is use the tool together uh, just to get people comfortable with it and address questions that come up as you use it. So you, are, you all are largely our inaugural audience here um, and we're looking for feedback and insight on you know, how it goes when you actually go to uh, try out the tool. So just know that the um, tool is the same uh, no matter which way you use it. So whether you use uh, SMS, so text messaging. So if you just open up your, um, your texting on your smartphone and start a new message and enter that, that 877-277-4413 number, or if you go to WhatsApp um, and save that 651-333-2144 number and then text support or apoyo, um, or you can go to the website and use the web chat. And for um, demonstrating today, I'm going to use the web chat, uh, but you can follow along on whatever, uh, whatever works best for you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see what this looks like. Um, so here's the Wisconsin Collaboration on Immigrants and Public Benefits. And uh, this is a new website. Uh, we migrated much of pretty much all the information that was on covering Wisconsin's website related to immigration and public benefits to this website in order to optimize use of the web chat. Um, over here in the corner, you can see there's a little pop-up message and it says web chat help. And that's what you're gonna click in order to open the tool. So I think uh, briefly we can go back to the slide deck, Jenny, uh, so we can get a, a little bit more information in our first scenario that we're gonna work through. Yes, okay, so very important to know that when using the texting tool, the tool is anonymous and no identifying information is saved or stored. Um, it is also critical to know that this tool does not provide legal advice. So this tool is gonna provide some information, but not case specific legal advice. 
However, uh, there will be links to legal legal providers in the tool. So to connect people to that legal advice that they might need, um, as we discussed before, all three platforms give the same information um, and the tool will not tell you, and just so you all know, the tool will not tell you if a person is eligible for a public benefit program based on their status or other factors. So when we use the tool, I think that final point will make more sense. And also just to back up one slide, there was a, there was a code that you can scan on the screen. Um, that is another way that you can open up the SMS text messaging tool. Um, and just to know that message and data rates will apply. So, you know, if you get charged per text message on your smartphone, then those rates, you know, will apply here. Um, okay. So that's just a little screenshot of the public charge um, screener on the website. We can go forward. Um, and so we're going to start with one um, family story uh, where you would where you can use the tool. So so here's our story. Mary is a permanent resident who has been in the U.S. for six years. She wants to apply for Badger Care Plus and Food Share. She's concerned applying for benefits could hurt her ability to become a U.S. citizen. So oh, we're going to go ahead and go over to the tool. So I will share my screen. OK, so you get this first message. I hope everybody can see this OK. OK, uh, so here, here is the the introduction. So if you want to use the tool, you just decide based on your keyword whether you want to use it in English or Spanish. So if you choose support, you're going to interact with it in English. If you choose Apoyo, uh, the messages will come through in Spanish. So then it's going to give you a few more messages. So please answer a few questions. It's going to remind, it's going to share that this information isn't legal advice and won't be collected. And then it's going to start asking questions about what is the immigration status of the person that you're using this tool to get information about. So in this case, Mary was a permanent resident or Mary is a permanent resident. So I'm going to pick that one. And then it's going to give a message um, based on that specific immigration status. So here it tells us it is safe for a permanent resident to use public benefits. Um, using benefits doesn't affect a green card renewal or citizenship application. If a green card holder leaves the US for six months or more, um, certain public benefit use may affect reentry. And then it asks a question. Does the permanent resident plan to leave the US for six months or more? So if you were assisting Mary, you could ask her, do you plan to leave the US for six months or more? She says yes. Um, it's going to ask about the time parameters for um, public benefits use. And probably a lot of people are going to say, you know, I don't know um, in terms of the dates. I, you know, I, I'm not sure. So you can put that in there. And then it's going to give some information about, and this is a lot of information, so you might have to scroll up about which um, public benefits are at play for a permanent resident who plans to leave the, uh, who would leave the US for six months or more. And so it's gonna go through that list that we saw earlier. So the cash benefits, the assisted living, um, those are, those were ones that were in place prior to the new administration um, and prior to the new public charge rule and new, I mean, early 2020. Um, and then also these benefits, if they were used on or after February 24th, 2020. So Badger Care, um, food assistance and housing assistance. Um, and then it's gonna give a little nudge here. If a permanent resident plans to leave the US for six months or more, they should talk to a lawyer. Um, and it'll give a link to find a free or low cost lawyer. And you can follow that link and it will take you to a list.
All right, that list is loading. Just know it's there. And that's a great way to connect with a lawyer who has expertise in this intersectional issues of um, immigration and public benefits. Um, and then it further is gonna ask, is there a plan to petition for a family member to get a green card? And so you can talk to the person and say, you know, <clears throat> is there a plan for a family member to get a green card? And, and if you say yes, going to give you the prompt again to get some legal advice. Um, immigration law is complex. And when somebody is, is petitioning for a green card for a family member or for themselves, it really behooves them to get some advice from a professional, uh, like we talked about from a attorney or a DOJ representative such as Janice. And so it's gonna connect people back to those resources um, to get that critical legal advice that they would really benefit from. And then this tool will also link back to um, the website for people to get more information. Okay, let's go back to the slide deck. Great. Okay. So we are going to go ahead and hopefully everybody has been able to uh, get the screener up and running, um, whether it's on your phones or on your computers. And we're going to go through this family story together and uh, answer some questions. So I'm going to let you all do it on your own and then um, we'll come back and discuss it. So have your screener up and ready, ready and here's, here's the story that you're gonna work through. Um, so Anna has a U visa and her child, Manuel, is a US citizen. Both are eligible for Badger Care Plus, but Anna is worried about enrolling um, both herself and her son in Badger Care Plus. She just, she says, I'm worried about it. I'm worried it might impact my um, immigration status. Um, so use the tool and let's see um, what information you can provide to Anna about public benefits use and her immigration status. So first, I recommend that you use the tool to get information about Anna's status. So go ahead and enter that into the tool. And if somebody can give me an indication of, of when they've been able to follow that step. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Oh, okay. Yep, we can go over to the screen and I can do it along with you. Um, so let me share my screen. Oh, sorry. So we're gonna go share. And I'm going to restart the session by typing support. So that's just going to reset for a new session. So Anna isn't any of these statuses. So I'm going to go other. I'm looking for you. She's not any of these. So I'm going to go other again. Oh, there it is. You or T visa. So I'm going to click that. And so it says, it is safe for this person to use benefits. It won't hurt their immigration status, even if they apply for a green card in the future. Okay, so that gave some good concrete information for Anna. Um, now, if Anna said, um, I, I'm still a little, con or, you know, if you still had, if you have questions and you're thinking, okay, but her son, her son is a US citizen and he's going to 
um, apply for benefits as well. I have questions about that. So I'd restart for a new immigration status. So um, I can type support and that's gonna reset. Okay, her son's a US citizen. So I'm gonna put in US citizen. Okay, and again, I get the message, US citizens can safely use public benefits. It won't hurt their immigration status or their family member status. And then it asks this additional question, is there a plan to petition for a family member to get a green card? And you can ask Anna, is, the, you know, is there a plan? And if she says yes or no, you can indicate here. So if she says, no, um, I don't have a plan right now um, to petition for a green card you know, for myself. Um, and it's gonna repeat that message about US citizens can safely use benefits. It won't hurt their immigration status or their family member status. Now I can reset and go back through if Anna was to answer that uh, question a little bit differently. I'd go back, find her U status. Gonna get those messages that I already received. Am I stuck? Maybe I skipped something. Okay. So I wanted to go back and see this message. Is there a plan um, to petition for a family member to get a green card and to see what the um, prompt there was? And I don't know, um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next case. Um, I'm gonna go back and check the logic of the screener because uh, that question did come up the first time and. I'm not sure why it didn't appear the second time I went through it. Um, try it here. Because you will get a prompt. If, if somebody indicates that they are um, planning to apply for um, a green card on behalf of a relative, you will get a prompt um, for them to receive, um, to talk to an attorney to get some legal advice. Um, so, I just, you will see that prompt a lot, whether it's a person who is indicating that they want to change status um, or whether it's that, that the person's, like the permanent resident wants to apply for a family member uh, to get a green card. And then you are gonna get that prompt to get some legal advice. And then it is very important to connect that person to a free or low cost legal service provider. Um, with some expertise in low income immigration issues. Um, so we're going back to the PowerPoint. Um, and this is about petitioning for a family member to get a green card. So, you know, people who are doing this really should get legal advice. They should connect with a legal service provider. Um, please use the links we provided to connect them um, with a low income um, legal service, legal service providers who are, who who serve low income populations and are focused on the issues that they face, um, you know, encourage them only to get advice, legal advice from an immigration attorney or a DOJ accredited represent, representative. Um, maybe they heard something in the community, maybe they've talked to a notario or, you know, share some other source, encourage them to, you know, go to a reliable source of information for these types of um, issues. And also reassure them, you know, it's okay to get legal advice from more than one source. So if they talk to an attorney who said, and we have heard this, um, absolutely, like no one should ever use public benefits if they have anything immigration related at all. And so that's, you know, something that they come to you with and share with you. Um, and you're not an attorney and you're certainly not in a position to say that, you know, what they were told was wrong, but you can say, like it's okay to get some additional legal advice um, from 
another um, legal source of information. And Janice, maybe you can touch on this a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Um, it and um, there. Um, please use the um, the list of of um, accredited reps and um, attorneys, nonprofit organizations um, that are available um, through Covering Wisconsin and um, the links on this presentation. <clears throat> it um, the other thing too is um, it, I mean immigration it, the processes are so complex, it's very hard to navigate and it's critically important um, that immigrants who are applying for a benefit or an American citizen or green card holder petitioning for somebody works with um, an immigration attorney or a DOJ accredited representative. I've um, The cases I would say that are hardest for us to navigate at CMC are folks who um, tried to do it on their own um, or got some poor advice and now this information has already been submitted to the government and it's much harder for um, for us to kind of undo um, damage um, than than it is to get that good advice up front. Thank you. Um, one thing, a couple of things that kind of happened in the chat that I thought I would recap because otherwise the recording won't capture those conversations that were happening. So one of them, um, Shannon, as you were doing the last example, people were simultaneously doing it and they said that um, when you were in as the son, as the U.S. citizen, that's probably why you didn't get that seek legal advice, but that some other people were able to get the and saw that the seek legal advice came up. So. We'll continue to test that out. But a couple of other questions that came through, um, somebody had asked, you know, are there certain hours of the day in which these people can use the tool? Um, this tool, so thank you to Michelle um, for answering the question. This screener is not monitored by a person. It is those automatically um, generated responses that based on this expertise of people who had entered those responses previously. And so there's a lot of possibilities, but it should be a great starting point um, to get the kind of response that you need. So that is 24 seven, that that would be automatically generated. And then also if somebody tried to scan the QR code through the PowerPoint slide, you would have gotten it in English. We do actually have a QR code in Spanish, but the one that was up on your slide was the English version. And then um, before we move on to the resources section and finish up here, the other question that I know came a while back was just, are there certain state or federal regulations that organizations should um, consider or be aware of pertaining to texting patients? So it's kind of a larger question, but I think in this instance, um, just now that you've seen the tool, maybe you see that it's not that you are texting a patient, it's that you're utilizing this tool. And so whether you are there entering someone's case scenario to get some um, advice, which I think as an enrollment assister for health insurance would be really helpful if I'm sitting with someone, I would use the tool and ask them questions and feel more confident to move forward with an application or the consumer themselves is using the tool. So this really, this tool anyway, is not impacting at all a relationship between a provider and a consumer texting each other. Thanks for allowing me that interruption. And then we'll move on to the resources part. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so we wanted to touch on how you can promote the tool in your community. So Covering Wisconsin has flyers and social media posts um, from their 2021 toolkit. And you can follow the link when you get the slide deck or you can go to their website, um, just type in Covering Wisconsin and go to the promotions page and you will find a way to download these materials. And so you could um, hang these flyers at your clinic or in your office. You could um, you know, do an email, you can post on social media. Another way is to follow Covering Wisconsin on Facebook and Twitter and reshare uh, the posts. And Jenny has put the media toolkit um, into the chat as well, so it's there for your reference. We can go to the next slide. If you would like, you can integrate the web chat tool to your website, to a particular web page, so that maybe people who are going to your website to get information about things can interact with the tool. 
And we have step-by-step -step instructions for implementing it to, on your website. And um, Michelle, our <clears throat> great partner at Community Connect Labs, excuse me, um, she will work with you directly um, or work with your website administrator to get that tool up and running. And if you'd like to do that, um, you can email the info at coveringwisconsin.org and we will get you connected and set up. You can customize um, the colors of the tool, um, just so you know, and then uh, we will be able to see some, you know, high level information on like the number of clicks that the tool is getting on your website uh, in the back end. So we won't see any, as we shared before, any identifying information about the users, but we can kind of see whether or not the tool is getting um, traction on your specific website. So if that's something you're interested in doing, please, please let us know. Uh, and then I just wanted to highlight a few additional resources. Um, so Covering Wisconsin has additional um, enrollment assister materials, uh, specifically one resource for undocumented immigrants and getting um, healthcare healthcare coverage and also their healthcare um, options. Let me go to the next one. Uh, we have specific resources and I will go ahead and share my screen to hopefully, so you can see them a little bit larger. You can close out of the tool. Um, Of course, now I'm not getting the header on the web page for some reason. Um, where you can you can go to this website, the immigrantbenefitswisconsin.org, um, and find resources specific uh, to public charge and generally about immigrants and public benefits use. Um, there's a resources page here, and I just seem to have a really pokey internet connection this morning, so I apologize, everyone. Um, but I think most importantly there, what I would want people to check out is there is a whole sheet on public on public benefits that are not a part of public charge that anybody can use. And to really, um, I want to emphasize that you can see that sheet here um, that you know the COVID nineteen related relief programs are not part of the public charge um, test in any way. And so please, you know, help reach communities and provide reassuring messages that they can get vaccines, that they can get care, that they can get tests, um, you know, free of charge and not subject to public charge in any, in any way. Uh, we can go back to the slide deck, Jenny. My computer is just taking forever to load things. So you can see little versions of that. Um, and then also there's a national resource protecting immigrant families um, and they have many resources posted. They uh, have additional languages available. And so if you're working with populations that speak some of these languages, um, that might be a great resource for you to access to get materials in alternative languages. And we can go to the next slide. And so we just wanted to close uh, with the five key messages um, that most immigrants and mixed status families can safely use public benefits, um, that public benefits used by family members will not count against the person ap applying to change their status. Um, only use of specific public benefit programs can have a negative impact on a person's status. So we talked about that a lot today. Um, use of public benefits does not automatically make a person a public charge, even if they are subject to that public charge test. Um, it's one part of a much larger um, application and process. And testing, treatment, and preventative care for COVID-19, including vaccines, um, is not part of public charge or the public charge test. Next slide. So if you have any questions, um, we can hang around a little bit, uh, I think, um, to answer them because we are at 11.01. And just thank you so much for attending. Um, please complete an evaluation on the training. Um, you can click the link, it's in the chat box.
And thank you to everyone who joined today. We really appreciate it. And we didn't get through as many um, examples as we had hoped. So if you have questions um, or if you, as you use the tool, if you have feedback, please let us know. You can use that info at Covering Wisconsin website. And, you know, I just want to share my uh, appreciation for the work that you all do uh, in helping people connect to life-saving public benefit programs that really um, enhance and improve their own lives and the lives of their kids and just helping to get the word out that many of these programs um, are safe for everyone to use. Very few people are actually impacted by public charge, but the fear is real. Um, and to acknowledge that fear when you're working with people and help you know, provide reassuring messaging uh, when you can and, and help provide connections to free and low cost attorneys who are well versed in this topic to get people legal advice when they need it. It's so important and it's such a valuable service. So thank you for all you do each and every day and for adding this to your, you know, your tool belt of tools in serving the clients and consumers and patients that you serve each and every day.